So we talked about the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, today what I wanted to show is why, you know, like the... the proofs or the evidences or the telltales that the person he was speaking with belonged to a cult group. Definitely, we talked about the divinity of Christ. And then the next thing I'd like to, and then we gave you the, we gave you the four, at least four verses that are directly referring to Jesus being God. First John, I mean, John 1, 1 through 3, and then we jump to 1, 14. And then Hebrews 1, 8, I throw no God is forever, but this, unto the Son, he's, oh, John 1, 1 to 3, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, the same was in the beginning with God. And then it says, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Then 14, um, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. Hebrews 1, 8, but unto the Son He saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of righteousness, or a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of Thy kingdom. And in John 20, 28, I was Thomas's Thomas's response when he saw Jesus, uh, and Thomas said unto him, "My Lord and my God." And then, of course, Isaiah nine six, a prophecy about the Messiah, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, or the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. And then the Prince of Peace. Okay, so another thing that they talked about, uh, which again shows the characteristic, one of the characteristics of a group, and we've got to be very careful not to call, and not to be, not to hasten in calling uh, religious persuasions as a cult group, unless we know that they are really a cult group, like the quali qualifiers, the qualifications of being, or, or characteristics. Of, being, of them being a cult organization. Um, otherwise, we may be calling fellow Christians cults just because we're different or we have differences when it comes to the disputable matters of the word. And, and mind you, there are Christian groups and uh, who are very, very fast, very quick in addressing or calling or characterizing fellow Christians or Christian churches or denominations as either cult or heretics or heretical. Um, again, I'm, I'm encouraging or urging everybody not to be a part of that. We, we got to be very careful, especially when it comes to referring to our fellow believers. Okay. So another thing that I know about that group that he was referring to is their belief in the necessity of membership in their religion. And as I said, this is some a characteristic that marks them, marks them being a part of the cult group because of the, I'm going to share it to you if you want to write it down, write it down because I didn't give you any outline regarding this, by the way. So I'm going to give you um, an easy way of recognizing a cult group based on these characteristics. I want you to think about mathematical symbol or mathematical applications or operations, okay, which is addition, subtraction, multiplication and division, okay? Addition, subtraction, multiplication and division. Add, subtract, multiply, divide. When you remember them, you connect the characteristic with them. The first one, okay, is it adds to, okay? It adds to God's word. It adds to God's word. Now, the Bible tells us that that's something that we ought to not do. And I'm going to give you verses again to prove to you that the Bible has something to say about us not being so free to add to it or deduct it, to deduct from it, even if we feel like we have good motive in doing so. To probably wanting to make it more effective or probably wanting to make it less offensive that we, we add our opinion or we, we don't want to share but we somehow say it, does, it is not there when it's actually there. Okay, so where do you see that in the Bible? So I want, I want a bell, will you be sweet for us? Deuteronomy 4.2. And let's go to Deuteronomy 4.2. Again, we're using the New Living Translation. If you would all go there, Deuteronomy 4.2. I'm going to have Ati Bell read it for us. Deuteronomy 4.2. 
do not add to or subtract from these commands I am giving you. Just obey the commands of the Lord your God that I am giving you. There you go. Do not add or subtract from the commands I'm giving you. Do not add to, to God's word. That's basically what he's saying. Then the next one, Revelation 22. Uh, can I have, let me see. I want, I want the gallery view so I can see everybody. Okay. Revelation 22, 18. May I request uh, Anthony? Can you read it for us? If you could go there. Revel everybody go to Revelation 22, verse 18. And make sure you unmute yourself. Revelation 22, 18. Um, I don't have my Bible with me right now. Okay, okay. So let's see. I'm sorry about that. No problem. Then we have Matt. Oh, yeah, that's true. You're using your phone. Uh, Maddie, would you please read that for us? Revelation 22, 18. Revelation 22, 18. And I solemnly declare to everyone who hears the words of prophecy written in this book, if anyone adds anything to what is written here, God will add to that person the plagues described in this book. Okay. There you go. Again, the warning about adding. Although this particular passage in the book of Revelation is in context referring to the prophecies that were presented in that book, I believe that the principle applies. It's the same. For the entire Bible, in Deuteronomy 4, to tells us again, do not add or subtract from these commands I'm giving you. Okay, so um, that's one of the characteristics. They add, that's the reason why if you notice that a certain religious group or a particular religious organization or persuasion have their own um, Bible, okay? Most of, if, if they have their own Bible or they have their own particular Bible translation, that may be, that may be a, a, an indicator already that, or they have extra biblical sources that although they say that the Bible is their authoritative rule for conduct and doctrine, but they quote uh, their founder and the writings of their founder, probably as much as they quote the Bible or Let's say, for example, they go to that because I've been in one. Okay, I've attended a, um, and I'm familiar with a group. Uh, I'm not going to mention to you which one. I'll tell you, Seventh day Adventists. Okay. <clears throat> uh, it's, it's a debate for some people whether Seventh day Adventists are saved or not, okay, or Christians or not. But um, one thing that you would notice, and I've noticed so far, at least in my experience, it may not be like this. Uh, as I said, I don't speak negatively about especially against, against any born-again Christian church. But I, if I know it's a cultic group, I don't, I don't like hesitate from pointing things out. So when in my experiences I've, I would, that I've attended and watched, when it's, it's almost automatic that every time they preach, they would have quotes from the Bible and they would have quotes from Ellen White who is Ellen White. I was not familiar with her until I, I saw and watched some and attended because we, we sang a special number in one. Um, hearing the preachers, they, they would always quote Ellen White. It may not be as much as they quote the Bible in a certain service, in one service or for each service. But what I noticed was there are thousands of other Christian writers. There are thousands of other Christian books. But um, somehow, like for every for every quote of another Christian, they've they have probably quoted Ellen White a thousand times. You know what I'm saying? So so you know that there's an authoritative addition of of word or revelations or truths, okay, that they hold as perhaps equally equally authoritative. Okay, so they add to they add to God's word. So the second one we talk about subtraction. Okay, you subtract. Okay, so the second one is you subtract from the person of Jesus Christ. You subtract from the person of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to assign somebody to um, read it for us. Bell, can you be, can you be doing the call? Can you see the, no, I have to have a gallery view because I need to see everybody. Somebody from now. Skokie, would you please go ahead and read that one? Second Corinthians 11. Can we all go there? Second Corinthians 11, 3 to 4. Second Corinthians 11. Three, two. 
but I fear that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted, just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent. You happily put up with whatever anyone tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus than the one we preach, or a different kind of spirit than the one you received, or a different kind of gospel than the one you believe. Okay, there you go. That verse, that, verse is, that verse is referring to a different Jesus. And that's something that what you would notice, is, I don't know if you're familiar with some, but one of the things that a cult group does is to, they say they, say they, they humanize, they humanize Jesus, and they deify humans. Okay? They humanize Jesus, and they deify humans. So I mean to say, they bring down Jesus, and then they elevate humanity. Okay, so that's something that, in 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 some cases, they actually make Jesus almost like just a mere prophet, and they make people, they make human beings gods. And there are people who do teach that we are gods, we are divine. In in trying to interpret some parts of the scriptures that has to do with divinity or God or divine nature residing in us. Some of, some of we go to the extreme of thinking that we are gods or, or people saying that we are or teaching that we are gods, okay? So that's the second thing we subtract from. We subtract from Jesus. And the third one is the multiplication, okay? multiplication. And this is multiplying. Remember what I told you a while ago, we're in, you got to the, the, the characteristic of the group that the person was speaking to me about, um, they believe that salvation, you got to be a member of their particular organization for you to be saved. Now, where do you see that? It's a multiplication thing. Okay? You multiply the requirements so, or you multiply the requirements of salvation. You multiply the requirements of salvation. Galatians 1, 6 through 8. Galatians 1, 6 through 8. May I hear... Um, Moses, are you there? Do you have your Bible with you? Yeah, you want to read for us Galatians 1, 6 through 8? You may want to unmute yourself so we could hear you. You have a Bible? We can't hear you. You have to unmute yourself. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. No. Okay, okay. Give me just a second. Galatians, which one? One, six through eight. Galatians one, six through eight. Okay, give me just a second. Galatians one, six through eight. Okay, so it says, oh wait, uh, which translation are you using? I have the New King James. It's okay. Uh, we're using the New Living Translation. Is that accessible to you? Um, I New Living Translation. I have to look. Let me just a second. Okay. New Living Translation. Okay. So, sorry. I'm normally I use the uh, uh, New King James, but I think I have one here okay, in this no tab. Problem. New Living Translation. Okay, I found it. Uh, Galatians. Okay, Galatians chapters, chapters chapter, one. Chapter one, six through eight. Six through eight. Okay, it says, um, I'm shocked that you are turning away so soon from God who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. You are following a different way that pretends to be the good news, but is not the good news at all. You are being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Christ. Let God's curse fall on anyone, including us or even an angel from heaven, who preaches a different kind of good news that, than the one we preach to you. Okay, please, God. Actually, here the reference is... The reference here has to do more of adding something uh, different, or of giving a different gospel or a different way of salvation. But this is, a good, this is good enough to apply to the multiplication of. So, um, because the reference here in Galatians has to do with the Judaizers anyway, like people who say, yes, you receive Christ by faith. And that's what we believe about salvation. 
received God, Jesus Christ by grace through faith. But, but what's being addressed here is that aside from that, there are those who teach that circumcision has to be added to. Okay, circumcision has to be added to the faith receiving of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they're adding or multiplying requirements for salvation. And that, again, as I said, a lot of people would knock on your door. And by the way, some people have speak, have, we, we, we hear, they believe that their salvation is by grace through faith. Okay, they, they believe that salvation is by grace through faith. But, but um, I noticed that some of them are not that vocal about it, but um, it was, for some it is, like because as I said, I'll tell you the experience that I had when I attended a, uh, I said, okay, that's the reason why, because there was, a, there was a, a guy who was going to a Bible school, a Christian Bible school, who visited our church, but he was a Seventh-day Adventist pastor or evangelist. So he came, he was a visitor of one of our members or of one of our attendees. And then after that, uh, he was gonna speak in a Seventh-day Adventist church in Simi Valley. And, and he invited me to go. So my wife and I went, and so he started preaching. Everything he was teaching was very good. Of course, the quoting again, he, he quoted Ellen White. Uh, it's almost like a staple for them. And then he was going through the slides. And then one of the last slides he had, when he was speaking about the number of people who was going to go through uh, to eternity and like the saved people, he gave a very specific number. On the slide, there was a very specific, I forgot exactly what it was. I'm not going to miss, I don't want to misquote it. But he gave a very specific number of people who are going to go to heaven or are going to go basically in paradise or whatever is the good place okay, that they refer to or the kingdom place that they refer to. Uh, I don't know how he referred to that. But basically, these are the saved people. Okay, And the number that he gave was equal to the number of the members of Seventh-day Adventists all over the world. Okay, so what is the, implica the implication there is only the Seventh-day Adventist people are saved and are going to make it in eternity in the presence of the Lord. Okay, that's the reason why that's the actual number he gave. But he went so quickly. I, I don't know if he saw there was also a problematic thing, but he had it in his slide. But he went very quickly through the slide because, you know, like he knew we were there and he probably like, it, it's a very questionable, it's a very questionable stand there. So, um so that's an, an example of what I'm telling you that you gotta be a member, but uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know if they have changed it. I haven't researched it very recently, but one of the main uh, dogmas of Roman Catholicism as well is that you have to be a member of the mother church. Okay, you have to be the member, a member of the mother church for you to be saved, okay, to be to experience salvation. As I said, I'm not sure if they've changed that, um, or progress from that, but that was when I was still a very staunch Catholic like boy, supporter, okay? So that was our belief before. And then number four is divide. So we got, again, what was the first one? Add, add, or what, what is it? Add what? Add to the Bible, add to the Bible, okay? The second one, subtract, subtract from? Christ. From Christ, from the person of Jesus Christ, and then multiply followers. the way of salvation. Okay, oh. and multiply requirements for salvation, and the last one is divide. When it talks about divide, it's a little tricky because you have to think about the word separate. Okay, you separate do these the cult groups separate themselves from the rest of Christianity, having to do almost it's like very related to number three, where you add requirements to salvation. Why? Because you separate yourselves from the rest of Christendom, basically what you're saying is we are the only ones. They claim, the cult group claims that they are the only ones who have the corner of the truth. They separate themselves from the rest of quote-unquote Christendom by believing that they're the only ones who are saved. They're the only ones who got it right. They're all the only ones who are basically anointed church of, by God. You know, so that's what it is. Okay, so if you remember those four, those four will indicate, let me see. Um, let me quote to you something here. Okay. And this is from Ligonier Ministries that, that I'm gonna quote. This is from the Watchtower. Okay, this is from the Watchtower. Okay, Watchtower, by the way, is a, is a Jehovah's Witness 
publication in 1967. This is actually what they have. LDS members, referring to LDS, okay, which is Latter-day Saints, which are the Mormons. It says, LDS members believed they belong to, quote, the only true and living church upon the face of the whole earth. That's from Doctrines and Covenants. Jehovah's Witness believe that since 1919, the organization has served as Jehovah's, quote unquote, sole visible channel through whom alone spiritual instruction was to come. So both of them, the LDS, the Mormons, believe that they're the only true living church on the, earth, on the face of the earth. Jehovah's Witnesses that the only true representations of God or representatives of God here on earth against um, separating themselves or lifting themselves up higher than the rest of us. It's almost like they're the only ones, the rest of us disqualify. So those are the trademarks of a cult, okay? So before we continue, does anybody have any question? Okay, so we're gonna go to the next topic after this. Okay, no more questions. Okay, go ahead, Angie. Um, I had a question, just wondering, even though they're um, serving God, do they will they go to heaven or is it just based on the relationship we have with God? Yeah, yeah thank you. Very good. Okay, it's very good. Um, it's very good um, question. question. Okay, so again, our salvation, you go back to our salvation, Angie. Remember I shared to you the gospel, the goodness of salvation, okay, which is what? It is by grace through faith. It is by um, repenting from our sins, right? It's repenting from our sins and putting or placing our entire trust on the person of Jesus Christ for our salvation and surrendering our lives to him as Lord. So that, repenting from our sins and then surrendering our lives to Jesus, him being our Lord, okay? And basically holding on to him for our salvation. The very fact that they're holding on to a different, to their religion as their salvation, they're having a different savior. Okay, they're multiplying the Savior. They're pulling down the effectiveness or sufficiency of Christ. It's like saying, Jesus, what you've done is not enough. I got to add this. Okay, so again, salvation is by grace through faith. Always remember that. Salvation is by grace through faith, not by being good. Um, not by, because if we, if we depend upon our goodness, we will be falling short. We will not qualify for heaven. Nobody will be qualified based on our goodness. And if we depend upon sincerity, that is not the Bible requirement as well for salvation because there are people who are very sincerely wrong. No, very sincerely wrong. A person may say, I sincerely believe that taking this poison will not hurt me, but they'll probably still die if they take that poison. So it's something that, it's something that uh, again, you have to always go back to the authoritative source of our belief, which is the Bible. Uh, we have 7 billion people in the world, a potential of 7 billion opinions on how to get saved. But the Bible gave us instructions, direct instructions on how a person gets saved. So there, I, we, we, please do not think that there are no virtuous people from other uh, groups, from other religious, even the cults. In fact, there are a lot of cult members who spend more time and show more devotion to God, to God, or to their religion or religious persuasion than many Christians do. And, and that's sad. That's sad. That's the reason why we're not going to water down the gospel and say, oh, because they're more devoted to Christ uh, based on their work and devotion, they're more devoted than Christians, then we will water down the gospel, or they too are saved, even if that's not based on what the Bible teaches. But it is a challenge that we're going to give to fellow believers to step up. We got to do more. We got to do better than uh, the people in the cult group. If we claim to be followers of Jesus, we really ought to be devoted and 100% commitment to Christ. Okay, and that's something that that's something that we got to to remember. Not by good works, not by sincerity. It is by grace through faith okay, in the in the person and the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Okay. Did I answer you, Angie? Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. God bless. All right, anybody else has any question regarding that? I'd like to share one thought. Go ahead, please, Doc. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with lots of Jehovah Witnesses for a year and a half, almost two years. One thing they've got in common, most of them, 
is that they're not happy. Mm. There's no joy. There's a few people with their own, you know, separate personalities who are joyful personalities. And you can't deny that. But they basically don't know where they're going. They don't have the, uh, they don't have the excitement, the transformation of the Holy Spirit in their own life. And they don't really know if they're going to heaven or not. So there's not not too much joy at all. And, and with the Mormons, similar. They don't have the transforming power of the spirit in them. So there's, they don't express the joy, the excitement, the life that comes through us. And they look at us and they think we're a little bit strange. <clears throat> but that's okay. <laughs> so that's something I noticed. Okay. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. I don't know if anybody would um would attest to that at least that's that's doc's personal experience i know of a lot yeah. of the stories um but of course like it's almost like they could so, sometimes it's very easy for them to um to come again to, to come against us as well like oh those christians <laughs> and, yeah and, and and they will they will share stories about christians that who claim to be christians but really are not um, they really don't have a relationship with the Lord, and then they'll give them as examples, and uh, that's the reason why there is a bad testimony of Christianity because oh, I bet. because they give testimonies of Christianity. Not everybody who claims to be Christian is a Christian. A lot of people don't know that, but people who claim to be Jehovah's Witness, they are because they're part of the religion. That's the way they see it. You're part of Jehovah's Witness religion. Uh, you have a membership there, and you're part of that. Yes, Ada, and they have they have they have a very unique. And we're not going to discuss this, but like Doc was saying that. They, some of them, like they're not sure where they're going. Some of them sound like they do. Uh, and, but the reason, and some of them have explained the 144,000 in the book of Revelation as the cream of the crop, the seven day Adventists will be spending time in heaven. And they don't know who that is, but at least right. they're very sure that the rest of them will be spending time here on earth in paradise here on earth, uh, if you're Jehovah's Witness, okay? And, and you're doing your job basically. All right, Ada, you have a question? I mean, one good thing about Jehovah's Witness is that they they are witnessing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I always wonder, like, wow, like, how they, these people, you know, must really believe in what they're uh, being taught because it is very hard to go door to door, but nonetheless, they do it. So I'm encouraged by uh, their boldness to do it, <laughs> even though it's not necessarily the right thing. But I just always wonder, I was like, man, like what, what gets you to like be so bold to do that? Like, cause you know, nobody wants to be disturbed at their house. Anyway, I was just thinking of that. Sorry. Yeah, thanks. More of a comment. We could, yeah, <laughs> thank you, Ada. Well, I'm telling you, we could learn a thing or two from them. Honestly, when it comes to when it comes to boldness in sharing the gospel, if we could develop that kind of attitude and passion and sense of urgency and responsibility, we will go a lot long way. I mean, a lot longer way than what we're doing right now. I'm not saying that we have to do the very same thing that they do because uh, when it comes to like knocking on door, door to door, because that may not be the most effective way anymore. I'm gonna to talk to you about that when it comes to evangelism eventually, but that may not be the most effective way anymore. It may be like it, so, so, so many years ago, I was told that the average one family, they get one family or one person, I forgot, for every 800 doors they knock on. Okay, they get one family for every 800 doors they knock on. Whereas Christians, years ago, the average was, if we invite three people, one will attend church. And for every three people who attend church, one of them stay. That's a much better stewardship of time. We just have to do it. We just have to do it. Okay, so that's again, yeah, again, not to bad mouth them, but I, I said, I, I don't have a problem. We love them. Well, in fact, we pray for them. We pray for them because when it comes to, and sometimes, sometimes you almost get tempted to, Lord, am I, am I missing something here? Because they really are. A lot of them are really devoted. I've spoken to some of them. Like the people who go around, like 
I don't know if he was a worker or a minister, but they really believed that they got the truth. And one example I, I could give you was the former neighbor of our church, the house next to the church, you know, the fence, the house next to it, very, ne very next to it in, in Cantara. They used to be Jehovah's Witness. And he took the courage. And one Saturday, work Saturday we had, I was in the Fellowship Square, not the, not the garden, but the Fellowship Square right outside the door, the main door of the church. I was seated there and he came. Are you the pastor? He, really, he spoke to me as a pastor, very congenial, very nice. And he offered me insurance first, you know. Um, I said, I'm sorry, you know, like, of course, uh, I, didn't, I, I didn't go for it. But, and then he go and he introduced himself as Jehovah's Witness. And the first question he asked me is, like, when, when you hear about Jehovah's Witness, what do you think about us? Again, it's very nice. So they study those approaches, by the way. And so we conversed, conversed, and communicated, and he invited me to a Bible study. And then I said, and I said, I'll be, I'll, I will go, I will go. Um, thank you for the invitation. With a condition, I said, for every Bible study that you have that I go to, I want you to attend a Bible study that I teach. Is that right? Every Bible study you teach, and we will agree. We will agree that we will keep an open mind that we may be wrong and the other person may be right. And secondly, if we, if we see that the other person is right, we will give in to it. We will abide by, we will subscribe by what they're teaching, right? So, so I said, me attending your Bible study, if I prove, if I get to prove through the word in your teaching that Jehovah's Witness doctrine is right, I will become a Jehovah's Witness. I said, I tell you that. So now I said, you have to do it also. If you sense with your open mind that I am right and you're wrong, you have to receive Christ in your life as Lord and Savior. You have to do this. And he goes, no, that, that's not going to happen because we know we're right. Like, oh, <laughs> I said, did I, did, did I just say that we have to keep an open mind, the possibility of it? I said, this is not going to work. Is, is it going to work that way if, you're clo if your mind's closed already without the possibility of probably? Because that's how you search the truth. How you search the truth is even if you already know that you know that you know that you have the truth, then you keep on having this open mind that there's a possibility we had a blind spot. We may have missed something that is very important. Okay, so anybody else? Contribute or question? No more? Okay, here you go. I know we'll not be able to finish the next topic, but it's worth giving it a try or starting it, all right? So the question that was asked in our Bible study on a Tuesday is this. I know some of you are very familiar with this. So I invite you to give your opinions because we have talked about this, taught about this, and learned about this many times over. So I know many, many of you already know. Please give your thought regarding this, okay? So the question, when people who speak in tongues, okay, when people speak in tongues, how come we don't understand them? The disciples in Acts chapter 2 who spoke in tongues were understood by those who heard them. That was the question. Okay, so let's all go to the scripture in reference. I mean, yeah, that they're referring to. It's just Acts chapter 2, 1 through 13. Okay, how many of you are excited because you know the answer already? <laughs> I want to hear from you. But, um, but the reference they were looking at was Acts chapter 2, 1 through 13. Let me see, who could, who have not, Jasmine, are you able to read? Sorry, Pastor, I was about to chat that I have to log off. My son needs to no, go no, to no, bed. No no, 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 no problem, no problem. Let me see. Okay. I'm going to Bye, you guys. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Uh, Angie, did you raise your hand or did you say bye-bye? No, I, I have my Bible. Okay, okay, then I guess. So read for us Acts chapter 2, 1 through 13. Okay, give me one sec. Okay, chapter two. One through 13. Everybody go one there and then listen to it because this is the reference of the question. Like, this is the story about how they were baptized in the Holy Spirit and they spoke in tongues and people understood it. Okay, go ahead. Okay. And when the day of the Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all of the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, 
and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galilee, Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes, I can pronounce this. <laughs> Parthians, Medes, Elamites. I'll read, I'll read from your, yeah, people from Mesopotamia, okay. Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. Go ahead, pick it up from there. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God, and they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, one minute this. Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. Okay, there you go. Thank you, Angie. All right. Okay, so that's the question. The, the very first outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and they spoke in tongues. They were understood by all different like nations that were listening or hearing them. They understood them. So the question that was asked is, how come when we hear people speaking in tongues, we do not understand them? Who would like to give it a shot? As I said, you've learned this many times over. Okay, good. You, if you if you don't recall what I've taught, let the Holy Spirit guide you and uh, remind you of all truths you've learned, or give it a shot as in your um, hypothesis, intelligent guess. Go ahead. Anyone? Anybody? There's got to be some of you. There's got to be some of you. Nobody wants to try. Mm -hmm. it? Oh, Why it can't we understand tongues? Nobody wants to try? Okay, I'm going to count one to three. One. I'll two. try. Okay, okay. You'd like to try. Who said that? I'll try, Pastor. Okay, Adam. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, I'm at the laundry mat. Um, I would say, uh, well, if you're in a church and you start to speak out loud in tongues and other people don't hear you, is that like the setting or is it, why can't people understand? Because, well, because it is, yeah, see, okay, you know what, I'll mute myself, it's, it's the music here. <laughs> I'll write my response. No, go ahead, go ahead. Um, well, I think it's because, well, because it's our heavenly language, it's our spirit directly talking to God, and um, I lost my train of thought. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's good. The, the, the follow-up question that a person would have is, but how come, how come, you, how come in Acts chapter 2, how come we understood them? How come the people who heard them understood their tongue? Oh, well, then it was because that was the first time that there were, well, in the, in the New Testament, that there was a sprinkling of the Holy Spirit, and it was a manifestation of God, like a supernatural manifestation to us. It was a baptism of the Holy Spirit over the church. Okay. So, so, okay. I, I know where you're going. I, I, I know what you're getting at. But mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll ask the question again. But how come? Yeah, yeah, we didn't understand. But how come I don't know? Yeah, we understood them. You're telling me that there was them having an infilling in baptism. They understood them. How come we don't understand you? We can't hear you. Can you, Ada? Unmute Ada first. Sorry, I thought I was muted. Or uh, unmuted. Well, I would have to read this again because I know the answer is there from my pastor. Okay. All right, who's next? Adam, did you want to try?
So the question is why other people don't understand? No, why is it that in Acts chapter 2, when it spoke about speaking in tongues, the people around them heard them and understood them? How come we don't understand people speaking in tongues today at church? That's, that's a question. Well, back then it was uh, to... Bring they, everybody heard tongues in their different languages and they said what is going on so it, it shocked them and got their attention as to the validity of something going on that was very special back then they 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 did not understand that they didn't understand the beginning that it was the holy spirit doing that but then they later you know after they start talking and preaching and giving uh, under giving a teaching then they understood it and it shocked everybody quite quite a bit they've never experienced that uh, for as far as we're concerned nowadays it's uh, our spiritual language is it's designed to as it says in what chapter uh, 10 is it no chapter 12 uh, in first corinthians if we're going to speak in our tongues out loud then we better give edific we better give um the the um the uh, what do they call it the i can't even interpretation edification interpretation right we better give the interpretation so everyone can understand what we're saying and uh and that's pretty straightforward sometimes we can pray you know if we're in a worship we can pray in a spiritual language and that's just between ourselves and the lord but if we're going to speak to the congregation, we better give an interpretation. Okay, so Doc, tell me, uh, we, um, tell me if I understand it correctly. So in, during that time, it was initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit. People didn't know what, what was going on. So it was necessary for them to be understood. Uh, in our days, uh, we got to have interpretation if we're going to speak to the church in a way that you will be understood. Right. You're saying, right? Okay. All right. Yeah. I know that somebody else wanted. Thank you, Doc. Thank you so much. That's true. Uh, there's truth in it. And then um, I know that somebody else wanted to, somebody already got me attention because she wanted to speak, but it's time. So we got we to have to wait for next week. It's a good, it's a good discussion. You could actually read on it if you want to have uh, more answers and, and contributions regarding this. You could read about it. Uh, on that, and then uh, share to us what you've learned. So we'll we'll stop here because we don't have time anymore. It's a good discussion, good to know, and um, I know it's going to be fun. Okay, God bless you guys. Awesome.